welcome to Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2022. In this session, we're going to look at the work of Verici, a company developing advanced clinical diagnostics for organ transplant. With me is its CEO, Sarah Barrington. Sarah, hello. Hello, nice to be um, uh, interviewing with you again. So lots of people will think of organ transplants and they'll think of all the things that are done before a transplant in order to uh, match organs. But actually what you're interested in is what happens afterwards and a kind of personalized approach to predicting how that uh, transplant is gonna go. So can you share with investors the opportunities you, that you've identified in that space? Yeah, thank you for um, sort of pointing out that it's much more about the patient than the organ. And I think that that's uh, quite a key uh, distinction when we start thinking about uh, organ health once it's been transplanted. Uh, so the opportunity here is that we're developing a platform based on a, a technology, um, next generation sequencing, RNA signatures, all sounds very complex, but really it's based on a couple of very simple premises. And that is that the immune system is one of many biological systems that the body is trying to tell us things about. And if you can measure them, uh, you can get some very valuable information. Uh, so we um, have uh, essentially a platform based on that technology, and we're developing a suite of products that go end to end. So pre-transplant, that gives the clinician information about the patient, how they're likely to respond. Very simple. Uh, am I going to have an aggressive response or a benign response? But that is crucial with uh, personalizing their treatment protocol. Then we have early stage damage, what's happening now, um, you know, and uh, we have late stage as well. So you can see we're taking clinicians and their patients all the way through the transplant story. And then not just individual tests, but because they're built on one underlying platform, they all inform one another. So instead of, you know, just saying, okay, I got a test. I've now got a platform, I've got a solution um, that really is quite helpful for that journey all the way through. And what kind of research underlies this platform? Yeah, um, it came out of Mount Sinai. Uh, Dr. Barbara Murphy uh, works on this for most of her life, actually, uh, but especially in the last 10 years. Sadly, she, um, she passed this year, but she was delighted to see that actually this was finally coming through to, you know, the clinic. Um, out of academia. So Mount Sinai licensed it. It actually went licensed uh, initially to Renalytics for anybody that followed that story. We spun out of Renalytics uh, last year, went public in November um, and have spent this year doing what we call the foundational year. Um, but it is based on a decade's worth of uh, collaboration. She did um, a go-car study uh, with other centers uh, and for a pilot, it was very extensive. It was over 500 patients, three publications um, out there uh, for anybody that wants to pursue those. And then what we have done is brought it in uh, to product development cycles into the clinical validation. That's a multi-center blinded, everything's done very well. And it's global as well uh, to really give us the best kind of answer when we're validating those, resp uh, those results um, and then uh, the first two products come out at the end of this year. So it's very much a case of one size does not fit all. And the minute you find out that something isn't going quite right, then you can either develop more aggressive treatment or you can scale back your immunosuppression or, you know, there are multiple avenues for you to go down. Yes, I love that. I mean, I... Um... You know, the therapy options in transplant care are a little bit like taking a sledgehammer to a walnut, you know. Um, it is, uh, they're very, very big therapies. They suspend your entire immune system. There are uh, steroid, um, you know, regimes that go with it. Um, patients are very wary about the side effects and, and so are their clinicians. Uh, but it is necessary because otherwise, you know, you lose the graft and that has its own problems. But clinicians will talk about this need to balance. They're always balancing. If I give too much, I'm putting my, uh, my, my patient at risk uh, for passing infections or underlying conditions such as cancer. Um, but if I give too little, I'm going to lose the graft. 
and they don't have the information currently to enable them to personalize that uh, treatment. So they say, oh, we've got a one size fits all and we know it doesn't work. It's not even, we don't think we know it doesn't work as effectively as it could do if we had the information. And so this Vrici platform is most welcomed. So you've got these two offers, Clarava and Tutiva. Uh, they're laboratory developed tests in the US what does that designation LDT uh, offer and uh, how does the commercialization strategy differ in other markets? Thank you for asking that. It's always a complex area, uh, healthcare, isn't it? So in uh, the US, you have two um, options on the regulatory side. Uh, one is you can go through the FDA and that very um, suits, uh, for example, if we put something into a kit uh, and sent it out to others to run, that would be the appropriate um, way to go forward. But if you're doing a service in your own lab, um, and this is highly complex, it lends itself very well to the samples being sent to us and us processing it, you can do what is called the clear designation. It is much more straightforward. And I'm very pleased to say this year, we actually um, got our lab in Tennessee clear cleared. So we're absolutely ready to go for commercial um, offering. Um, but that means that um, effectively, as long as the sample, and again, this has its own advantage to the clinicians. They take a blood sample, they drop it into you know, a box, a mailer, whatever it goes to us, they get the result. It's as uh, complex as that for them. Um, and we how do quick is that, uh, Sarah? Yeah, how it can quick take is the four return? or five days. Mm -hmm. Right, because this information is, you know, these, these conditions yes. are very fast moving. Uh, yeah, that's right. Although the information, if you think about it, you know, you can take Clarava any time before the transplant and it's going to inform post-transplant. So they've got time. Um, and it's the same with Tutiva. What's out there in the marketplace is about the same timelines as well. Um, so, you know, I think that that's not a barrier to entry. And I think the simplicity at the transplant center is in fact an advantage. Um, and I think that's an important component of the uh, commercialization plan. I'd like to point to uh, reimbursement. Thrilled to announce we just got our PLA codes uh, for both products. That's, as you know, the first step uh, in a very so long term. Just explain for the, uh, for the audience that are not familiar with PLA codes, what that means, because it's, it's, a, it's a really important element in the US, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. So um, if you, most of the care is, is, is covered by um, Medicare, actually. Um, and it's a bit like the NHS, um, insofar as government sponsored funding. Um, what we have is to, to be able to access their system, there's three components. You have to have a code, you have to have a price determination, and you have to have what they call coverage determination. So you have to have all three and you sort of go in an order. So we've achieved first, the first leg of that stall, which is the coding, so they can identify us. Uh, this year we'll go for pricing. And the nice thing about coverage for us, uh, it's one of the reasons we have opened up where we did in our lab, um, is that local area already has a coverage determination for uh, Tutiva. Uh, there are competitors in that field, and so they have already established that it's a useful test uh, and will be covered underneath that. So we have two legs of the store for one product and one for the other product. Um, but that is obviously a very clear path in the US and something that um, you know, we're well underway with achieving. And what about other markets, for instance, in Europe? That's right, Europe is always an interesting market um, and um, you know, it can be very fragmented. The good news for us is that um, you know, to, to really improve um, organ supply, uh, in transplant is that they did this consortia across countries of transplant centers. Um, so I'm very pleased to say that in terms of a commercial rollout, it's, it's kind of going to be the same as you've got a distinct number of transplant centers to talk to within a grouping. Registry wise, that would be a CE mark uh, and we'll be looking at that next year, uh, sorry, this year, um, getting my years muddled up, 2022. Um, it's it's happening to us all, Sarah. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> it always happens when you collect the check, isn't it? Right. So, uh, um, so you know, we're we're expecting to do that, um, and then of of course the UK is its own system. Um, you know, we're providing the information uh, and gathering that together in health economics terms and qualities, so that we can go to the nice guidelines. And as you know, that's a very important entree to the NHS. 
And actually, at a time when there's a desperate shortage of organs and people are on waiting lists for very long times, you know, making the most, making sure that organs don't fail has, is becoming more and more important. I agree. And, you know, you get a better survival rate from a living donor. Um, and, um, but only about a third of all transplants are from living donors. Um, and I suspect that part of that is, is the, is the, the potential price you pay if you give up a kidney and it doesn't work. And so the more that we can reassure, um, you know, not only patients that we've got their best treatment plan and, and care pathway um, possible, but also to appeal to the wider audience of, of living donors that actually their sacrifice is well worth it. Um, and I think I hope to sort of increase that percentage, that split between deceased and living donors. Now, this is principally aimed at kidneys. Might the technology work for other types of organ transplant? It does. And, you know, um, one of the things I just, you know, take a moment to talk about our vision of our company. You know, I, I said, before we, we were sort of launching as three individual tests, the three legs of the stool, pre, early and late. They all then come together and inform one another. So you take individual tests, you then make it into a platform. And when we looked at that, we realized that we were really partnering with the clinician. Um, and so to build a clinician's platform, we wanted to look around in the marketplace to see if there are other technologies very complementary to answer some of those major problems that clinicians have uh, in their treatment of, of patient care. So we're building out that clinician's platform and that's being very well received. And then once we've done that, we, under that, we understand that the underlying technology is actually not only to other organs, and we will explore that, but actually other autoimmune diseases. So as you look at that, you can say, okay, well, from a biomarker side, um, you know, this is, this is multifaceted in terms of other diseases, other organs. Um, but one thing I'd like to highlight, Vivian, if you don't mind, um, is that's kind of half the breachy story. Um, you know, and I think that one of the important things to understand in healthcare is that increasingly, we are moving away from just being a biomarker story into also a data story. And one of the things that we do with this underlying technology, which is going to be important for not only kidney and other transplants, but the other diseases as well, is that we generate an enormous amount of data. So as we go through, at the moment, we do the entire transcript and that's all, all the genes um, and uh, effectively all the messaging there. We collect it in a, you know, big um, area, it's matched to patient outcomes, it's matched to clinical factors, and it's also matched to, um, you know, digitized slides on the pathology side, you know, that biopsy is still important as we go. And when you put all of that together, one of the things that's really important is that we're, one of our missions, in fact, is to increase the pace of innovation. Um, obviously, we're starting with kidney disease, but as we, but as we build this up, we recognize that it's important in every disease group that we tackle. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, I just can't move fast enough in this company. The opportunities are just way too exciting uh, and the potential is enormous. But as we partner with other um, companies in this space, utilizing what is basically a huge research tool, we really look to um, increase the pace of innovation. That's so interesting because you've, it's only when you've got those very large amounts of data that you can see the patterns exactly. that uh, you know predict particular uh, disease states and actually give you insights into into further research. Now, investors will want to know about your licensing and IP strategy. Quick word on that. Absolutely. Um, although a word of caution, you know, the world of diagnostics is in the US is not very kind to IP, but we still do it. Um, you know, I think our execution plan may give us more protection at the end of the day. Yeah, we have, um, we like, basically, we, we, we had a number of um, patents, uh, five or six, um, I'm sorry, I can't quite remember the number, and we're adding to them. Um, but we, we, we had that originally from um, Mount Sinai, and we licensed that. We have the exclusive worldwide license. Um, and then obviously, as we take these products, put them into our hands, make new discoveries, we're finding more and more IP to sort of circle around those core patents. Um, and I think, you know, 
Um, I think it's still more useful somewhere else. Europe seems to be holding up um, patent law a little bit more the rest of the world. The US, as you've seen, is being nibbled away to almost out of existence. But I still think it's really important to do, uh, and especially if you're going to have a global strategy. Now, to finish off, uh, let's look specifically to the year ahead. What are the timelines and what should investors be looking out for? Yeah, I mean, this is the year where, I mean, we said uh, last year, it's our foundational year. Uh, it, it, we may be a little quiet. We're going to be doing our clinical trial. Um, but this year, um, 2022, is where we move out of just being a pure R&D company into a commercial company. And I think that that's very exciting. So I have two products coming uh, that have come out of their endpoints in the clinical trials. Uh, I still have a third one. And we're expecting to uh, fulfill our patient enrollments on that third one, Protega, late stage. Uh, in this year, um, but the first two have now moved out of that R&D stage. At the end of Q1, we will have finished our analysis, we'll be moving into our commercial strategy. Um, that, that's a little sort of mixed in terms of Tutiva, straightforward, let's go out um, and start collecting real world evidence. That means I can sell, I'm fully qualified to sell, I'm, I'm uh, covered with that um, coverage determination, I just need to apply to be uh, recognized underneath that, and that'll happen in Q2. So by the second half of the year, maybe Q4, um, we will be making uh, commercial sales of Tutiva. Carava is a little bit more tricky. It's very novel. Um, there is nothing like it. That's the good news, bad news story. Uh, it means I have no competitors. It also means I have no precedence. Um, but I do believe that we will be out there you know, talking to centers, there's a, an incredible um, amount of interest from centers on Clarava because there is nothing else. Um, and so if we choose to go the more traditional route, it will be just going into um, utility studies and for the second half of the year. Uh, but we may find some centers that are just more interested. It's very well characterized. So we may find some centers that are interested in doing their studies in a more of a real world setting. So next year really is that move from being um, you know, a research into what I call commercial proof of concept. It's not that I'm going to be pasting up huge revenue numbers. And, you know, we're talking about commercial metrics like that. I'm going to be saying it's commercial proof of concept. Can I move something from just an R&D, uh, go through that process of now adopting it um, and getting those early sales by the end of the year? 2023, on the other hand, now that's when we'll start talking revenues. It sounds like it's going to be a really exciting year for you. And it's always such a pleasure talking to you, Sarah, and hearing mm -hmm. about the really innovative work that Verici does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.